Comfortably Zoned Radio Network presents Remembering Dynasty with Peter Gollenbach. We're back. Remembering Dynasty with Peter Golenbach. Actually, Remembering Dynasty bums and a whole hell of a lot more. Peter Golenbach, welcome to uh, the proceedings. Thank you so much, Rob. Good. I enjoy this, and um, we've had a good time. We're expecting Lenny Randall, former Major League player, who has been zoned before with me and an old friend of, um, of Mr. Golenbach. And I want to talk today about, I think it could be right up there with one of your three favorite books that you ever wrote, um, if you keep favorites. It's called Forever Boys, and it's about, um, you tell it, Peter. It's a senior league. Senior league. About the Senior Professional Baseball League. One of and the most how wonderful did that get things started, ever happened. How happen. did you get involved? Well, a fellow by the name of Jim Morley started it. Uh, his, uh, it was his idea. He, he was a, a big fan of senior golf, and he thought, why can't we do the same thing with retired baseball players? And so he came up with the notion that we would have eight teams throughout the state of Florida. Uh, they were in Winter Haven, they were in St. Petersburg, Orlando, uh, Sarasota, uh, various various cities. Fort Myers, uh, West Palm Beach was another one, uh, Port St. Lucie, which was where the Mets trained. And right. the idea was you had to be retired from baseball and older than 35 years old to play. And, Wait, how, is the, um, how did they choose teams? How were they drafted? Well, how were the players uh, a, a number of the teams, for instance, the St. Lucie team, uh, decided to use former Mets. And they picked fellows who anywhere from the age of 35 to, say, 50. Um, right. The Winter Haven Super Sox picked Red Sox. Uh, the the St. Petersburg Pelicans, which was uh, run by Bobby Tolan. He was our manager, former Cincinnati star. Bobby decided that to win this thing, what he needed to do was to pick the youngest players he could find. And that's what he did. Most of the players on the Pelicans were between the ages of 35 and 40. Um, and the play was starts November 1st, December, January, finishing in February uh, with championship. And among the players on that team was Lenny Randall. Uh, ah. he, was, he was a big part of... The Pelicans. Um, okay. Now, had, Lenny Randall yeah. could go down as one of the most fascinating people uh, on earth, let alone in baseball. Um, what attracted you to him initially besides his incredible charisma? Lenny is... Uh, well, I mean, nothing, you know, nobody in particular attracted me, attracted him to me. Uh, he was a Pelican. And, and what I intended to do was to interview every one of the Pelican players and talk about their career in baseball and what happened to them. Because with almost every other player, it's not sweetness and light. I mean, there are only a handful of Willie Mazes and Mickey Mantles and, uh, you know, players who manage to stick with one team and become big stars. Uh, every right. player uh, on, on the Pelicans was playing because – a, they had this tremendous love of baseball. B, they missed playing the game tremendously. And for some of them, uh, the problems in their life uh, could only be assuaged by a return to playing baseball. And this, this is what words, attracted me. Go ahead. No, I was going to say that the time spent on the field was probably an escape from what's become of their lives or, um, you know, grasping to get back. And, um... that, that, was, that was absolutely true for some of them. I mean, some of them came, you know, it, it was almost as though they hitchhiked 
to St. Petersburg to play on the team. I mean, some of these right. pl- these players who had been, you know, in the majors for a number of years were absolutely totally flat broke. Uh, some of them right. had and had drug the, problems. Even some of the big stars, the setting. Wh- what years are we talking about? 1989-90, and they okay. did it a second year from 1990 November 1st until Christmas Day of that year when uh, the whole thing folded. And I'll tell you why right. it later. And some of these players, like Raleigh Fingers is an example, it's before they made the Hall of Fame. Um, and actually what was available to them after baseball in terms of either staying in the game or living off their name wasn't like it is now. There's been more of an explosion towards taking care of the old players and what have you. A lot of these guys made good bucks for their time, but it, it was most of them, their careers were before free agency. So they, a lot of them never really made the big bucks that we consider, you know, like everybody that plays baseball is rolling in dough. Oh, well, that's absolutely just, true. When I, right, when I, when I did the Bronx Zoo with Sparky Lyle, uh, that was about the 1978 season. This was 1978. Uh, right. Now it's, it's ten years before the senior leagues, but but the point I wanted to make was, um, is, is that he was making $140,000 a year, and he was one of the highest paid Yankees. So so, um, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, and, and not only that, but he, even for some of the guys who were making more money, what happens for a lot of these people is, is that they are under the illusion that they're going to be able to make this money forever. And so whatever they make, they run through. And so once they retire and there's no more money coming in, um, they're in a certain amount of trouble. And for a lot of these people, for a lot of these people, they start playing ball as a 7, 8, 9, 10-year-old. Uh, they make it through high school. Uh, they perhaps uh, may go to college for a year or two and then sign in the minor leagues, or they may go straight to the minor leagues and go then straight to the major leagues. But all they know for their whole lives is baseball. That's their life. And when right. it ends, for a lot of these people, it's crushing. It's a terrible thing. I mean, you've learned yeah. to do one thing, and one thing really, really well. And then your career comes to an end, and you look around and go, what the hell am I going to do for the rest of my life? It's right. not easy. And, you know, it's not just that. We all have egos, and our ego, egos, uh, you and I, the working person on the street, can be satisfied all through our lives. We can get better at our jobs. We can become more proficient. We can become better writers, better speakers, better this, that, and the other thing. Mm-hmm. A baseball player gets to a certain age, and by – the nature of the beast, to use that expression, we're talking about something else, um, has to go downhill. And if your entire ego is wrapped up in the performance of your body, then guaranteed you're going to be messed up when that starts to leave you. Not just from a, from a, how much money can you make, this, that, and the other thing. But um, just from a psychological standpoint, unless you have something else. Now, to baseball's credit, most contracts, mm-hmm. most minor leaguers sign contracts that because so many of them were just signed and lost their eligibility to school and they'd be in, in camp for the first time, they'd sign 16 shortstops, 14 of them would be cut, and they could never go out, uh, out and get a free ride on their education. Well, most minor league contracts now, if you have an agent that's worth his or her salt, mm-hmm. will include an education thing where the kid can go go back to school after their career and it'll be on the club. So right. um, that forces change. Sometimes, so like with Jackie Robinson, forces changes to society. Whatever, and boy, baseball. Change doesn't come very quickly, does it? It's a, it's a conservative business. Am I correct? No, and, and, and most of the people playing in the senior league at any rate 
I mean, you have to remember that these are guys who ended up making it. Right. So these were not somebody who went back to college. Uh, these were people who, um, you know, went straight to baseball. Right. So, you know, so there was no, there was there was not not a whole lot, uh, you know, in terms of what they had learned to do anything else. I mean, one of the nice things about the senior league was that it gave these players an opportunity to make friends with other guys, some of whom were coaches in the minors, coaches in the majors, uh, batting instructors, pitching coaches, that sort of thing. Yeah, roving guys so, in the minors. Yeah. So I was able to see over the next you know, four or five years that, uh, say, a half a dozen to a dozen of the people in the senior league were able to find work in baseball, and that was great. I mean, Dick Bosman, for instance, who was one of our pitchers, a wonderful, wonderful guy. He had thrown a no-hitter with the Washington Senators. I remember Bozzi him well. is now, yeah, Bozzi is now uh, the pitching coach for the Tampa Bay Rays minor league system. Well, I mean, it's 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 a it's a terrific thing. He was with the St. Petersburg Pelicans, and somehow he was able, uh, once Major League Baseball came to the area, uh, to to sign on as a pitching coach, which was which was a terrific thing. Um, nice. Yeah. Um, yeah um, your book also talks. Uh, I think it was the Clearwater Phillies. Was was that the team? Uh, was the Clearwater made up of predominantly? Of not not in the senior Phillies. league. The Clear the Clearwater Phillies is is the minor league team of the Philadelphia Phillies in Class A. That was not oh, part. Okay. That was not not part of the not part of. Which the team league. had a predominant number of Philadelphia former Phillies? You got me. Okay. Uh, there well, was no there was no particularly. We we had we had some Phillies on our team. We had Yvonne De Jesus was on our team. Did you have Dennis um, Bennett on your team? Dennis Bennett? Right. I knew well, Dennis maybe. Bennett. I knew him from the Red Sox, but he he was he was not on our team. We had Ozzy Virgil Jr. He was from oh, the yes. Philadelphia Phillies. He was he was on our team. We had a wonderful guy by the name of Randy Lurch. I don't know if you remember Randy, I but do Randy remember. was a pitcher for the Phillies. And right. and Randy Randy was an interesting an interesting guy. Um, he basically was, he didn't have a home. I won't say he was homeless, but he was sort of living here and there and around when the senior league got started. Um, he had divorced from his wife, and he was sort of at loose ends. And it gave him an opportunity to put his life back together again. It was a wonderful, wonderful thing to see for Randy. He was a left-handed pitcher, pitched very, very well for us. Um, right. You know, these are the stories that I wanted to capture in the Forever Boys, and and I must say, uh, I was very very lucky when when I first started out. I went to the initial meeting of all the team owners. It was down in Miami uh, at the Breakers Hotel, and I was sitting there, and I noticed that one of the teams had Dick Williams uh, as the manager. Um, uh, the great oh. slugger from the Mets, Dave Kingman, was on the team. He was the left fielder. Um, we had uh, the manager of Texas the last few years. Um, he was just fired. Anyhow, he was the shortstop on the team, and I thought, you know, with Dick Williams oh, as the you, manager. Uh, Washington. Yes. Washington. Yes, Ron Washington, exactly. Well, I thought, a terrific oh, this was... infield instructor. He is a great right. teacher. The A's are happy and lucky to yep. have him back. That's just an And a great person, too, I must tell you. Uh, and I so I went, him, but... I, I went there, and I said to everybody, I would really like to spend the season with the West Palm Beach Tropics. And the West Tro Palm Beach Tropics, interestingly enough, is, was owned by the fellow who now owns the Boston Red Sox. Oh, wow. And it would have been interesting. And they said, okay. Well, the book that I had written prior to this experience was uh, Personal Fouls, uh, which was about the corruptive nature of Jim Valvano, the basketball coach at North Carolina State University. And after Personal Fouls came out, he was fired as both the athletic director and also the basketball coach. 
Well, one of his close friends was the PR director of the West Palm Beach Tropics. So after plunking down money on a house um, near Palm, Palm Beach, uh, I get this phone call saying, forget it. You know, we don't want you. Wow. So I'm thinking to myself, oh, my goodness, what am I going to do now? Um, I, um, I had a contract to do this book. Um, and so I called Jim Morley, who was the founder of the league. And Morley said to me, why don't you write about my team, the St. Petersburg Pelicans? And I said, great. Not knowing the first thing about St. Petersburg, I barely knew where it was. But this was, you know, a, a, a shelter from the storm, an opportunity, you know, to, to write my book. And so um, on October uh, 31st, uh, driving my car to St. Petersburg, uh, I, I'm, I'm riding along totally lost. And I saw the Don Cesar Hotel, which is pink, and the sun was setting behind it. And this is October 31st, and it was probably 75 degrees. And I thought to myself, this must be the most beautiful place on earth. And I woke up the next morning, and I went. I finally found out where the uh, St. Petersburg Pelicans were training. And I went to see Jim Morley, and I went to see Bobby Tolan. And Tolan says to me, I think we have a problem. And so I said, well, well, what, what's the problem? He said, well, I'm not sure the players want you hanging around. You know, these are major league ball players. What do they need some reporter hanging around for? So uh, Tolan said, uh, here's, here's what we'll do. I'll give you the opportunity to stand in front of the whole team and tell them what you're doing. So, so meanwhile, I, I'm sitting there in a chair talking to Tolan, and Doc Ellis, <laughs> who uh, was one no, of uh, Doc Ellis, in touch, Doc in, Ellis, know his fame. Absolutely. Anyhow, Doc Ellis, who was a shit stirrer to, 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 to beat all, is walking around my desk <laughs> saying, loser writer, loser writer. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, Oh, my goodness, what am I going to do now? So anyhow, I get up, and I go stand in front of this entire team. We've got all these fabulous, you know, major leaguers. Um, uh, you know, let, let me see, Alan Bannister, Lenny Randall, um, let's see, Kenny Landro, Dave Rasich, Steve Kemp, Ozzy Virgil, Jr., uh, Pat Zachary, Lamar Johnson, Bosman, Randy Lurch, Milt Wilcox of Detroit was there, Steve Henderson, Doc Ellis, Roy Hal, John Matlack of the Mets. Um, this was the group of people. I mean, these were really fine ball players. And so basically classy I got, guys. Your name is Oh, and guys. classy guys. Oh, just wonderful people. So anyhow, I, I got up there and I said, I said, look, I, I have no interest in, in telling tales out of school. What I want to do is I want to write about your love of baseball, my love of baseball how important it is to you, why you're coming to this league, why you're playing, and I want to give some of your prior history. I said, if there's anything, you know, that I write and you want to read it, by all means, you can read it before I publish it, you know. So, so I make this speech, and we, you know, everybody spreads to the winds. So I'm saying to myself, you know, I don't know whether they're good with this or not good with this, but the next morning we were getting on the bus and we were going to uh, Winter Haven. And I got on the bus and nobody said a word. And I was with that team for the entire three months, and it was one of the greatest experiences of my life. It was wow. just wonderful. These, these people accepted me and treated me like a teammate. Uh, I sat with them during games. I became the color announcer at home for the team, uh, and, and it was just, it was magical. It was just, it was wonderful for all of these players because it gave them a new lease on life. And it was approximately, I'd say, triple A baseball, maybe even better than triple A baseball because they may have lost a little bit, you know, with velocity in their pitching and may run a right. little bit slow, slower than they were. But you know the bases the are still nine feet. The game. 
Yeah. The new are absolutely the same. Absolutely yeah. the same. And and the chance to see these guys play again was so fabulous. It's just terrific. And and we played uh, I'll bet we played a sixty to seventy game schedule. We played almost now, every game every day. Uh, like you like, got to um, be a color announcer. Which yep, to me, I was. we're both Walter Mitty kind of people. If, if <laughs> am I right about that? And on some level, yeah, well, of, I mean, my whole life is a my whole life is kind of a Walter Mitty existence. But Jack Weirs was the play-by-play guy. Uh, he had right. been with the Baltimore. He had been with the Baltimore Orioles uh, when the radio station uh, uh, went bankrupt, and he was fired. And he came down and got the job. With the Pelicans, and, and Jack and I had the highest rating of any radio show uh, in Tampa Bay at night from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock. We had a huge following for, for our Pelicans. It was it was a lot of fun. Wow. Wonderful. Hey, uh, we're talking about uh, being a color man on radio. I want to skip uh-huh. around a little bit. I want to skip to your days um, at WOR. And um, talk a little bit more about Marty Glickman, because I okay. did an interview um, last week with a fellow by the name of Jim Friedman, and he wrote a, a documentary, a film documentary on Marty, and I want to know if your paths crossed. He was a producer no. at WN... They didn't? No. Okay. When, um, no, I, I had a show from six six o'clock to eight o'clock at night on Saturdays on WOR. Uh, they wanted to call it Peter Goldenbach on Sports, and that right. I guess was fine with me. And and it was fabulous because it gave me the opportunity to interview all sorts of wonderful people. And I did that for about nine months. Um, I I did not particularly like what they wanted me to do which was to open the phones and take calls from callers. You know, right. that's that's the heart and soul of, of sports radio today. And I wasn't much right. interested in that because I thought that most of the callers, the questions they asked were inane or the things they had to say were fairly, um, you know, use, you know, run of the mill. And so right. what I did with my two hours for the most part is I interviewed people. I, I, I thought that the view, the listeners would much more enjoy – you know, my interviewing Mike Marshall or, or interviewing Jim Bounton or, in, you know, interviewing people rather than listening to callers, callers talk. Um, I don't know how successful uh, I was. I have, have no idea. I know after nine months uh, I had to stop doing it because, you know, my day job was writing books. And, and right. though it was a two-hour show on Saturday – it turned out in order to make a two-hour show, I had to come into the station on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and and most of Saturday prior to the broadcast. And it made it very, very difficult for me to, me to continue to make a living as a writer. And after nine months, when I asked them to triple my pay, they said no. And that was that was the end of my radio show. Okay. Um Another question comes to mind. Just, um, I'd like to know how you write. Do you make an appointment with yourself to sit and write, or do you write down things when they occur to you? It, it, how do you regiment yourself? And well, I'm, you not, I'm not on somebody, more than one I'm or not, two projects at a time. Is it just one book at a time, or do you have several things going? Usually, it's one or two. Uh, and it's usually that I'm doing it with somebody else. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a book with Kurt Angle right now, the, 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 the you know, well-known wrestler. Uh, right. You know, I, I, you know, you know, Billy Martin, who knows, a, a lot of people you do books with. And so there's a process to it. And the process is that you start and you do research. So you want to know things. And, and so you sit and you make a list of all the things you want to know based on the research that you've done. And, and once you've done that, you then do uh, somewhere between 25 and 35 hours of interviews if you're doing a book with one particular person. And right. uh, you talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And then after you, you know, tape all of those things, then you transcribe the conversations that you have. And that, oh, okay. most of the time, gives, gives me 
you know, gives me the material that I need, you know, to write such a book. Now, if you're doing a biography, I did two long biographies, one of Billy Martin, one of Bobby Allison. Uh, the process is kind of the same, where you do the research to know what you want to know, and then you make the list of people you want to interview. You want to interview. Uh, with the Billy Martin book, there were probably 50 of them. And then okay. after you do all those interviews, you then transcribe all of those interviews, uh, and and then that those you know that information is what forms the narrative. Uh, I was fortunate with the Bobby Allison book. Um, uh, that book is called Miracle. It's one of my favorite books as well um, because Bobby in 1988 had been in a terrible, terrible crash, and I had heard that Bobby. Um, was probably not available uh, to be interviewed. So I started off by interviewing his two brothers, his brother Eddie, who I interviewed for about five or six hours, who was wonderful, and then his brother Donnie, uh, who was a little bit more close, but, but also wonderful. Uh, and then I called Bobby. Out, out. I mean, this is the things that I love so much about doing it. Turn, it turned out Bobby was absolutely as sharp as a tack. I mean, this crash had occurred something like eight or nine or ten years prior, and he, his brain had healed, and he was a marvelous, marvelous, marvelous storyteller. And he must have talked to me between somewhere between 15 and 20 hours. And and it's just, you know, it's wow. just wonderful. I mean, he 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 had two sons, and they were both killed. Uh, the younger son was killed in a crash. On the track, uh, oh. Davy was killed in a helicopter crash. He had just two boys, and he and his wife had to suffer through all of that terrible death. And then his awful. wife left him. His wife left him. And so here he is all by himself. He'd go sit by his plane. I mean, he still was suffered from this head wound that he had as well. Uh, and then the, the, the miracle of it was in the end, uh, um, um, Richard Petty's grandson had died in a car crash, in a, in a crash on the track. And so Bobby and his wife both met at the funeral, and they hooked up again and decided that they would, you know, let whatever anger they had with each other go by the wayside. And they remarried, which is oh, so fabulous. Nice. Just, yes. just fabulous. Um, wow. I love these people. They're just, just wonderful, wonderful people, and the story is a great story. And, and it was an unforgettable experience writing. It was unforgettable writing both of those books. Billy Martin, uh, of course, I had done number one with Billy, and so I knew him intimately, and I knew most of his friends. And so when he died on Christmas Day, and that was 1989, uh, it wasn't very difficult for me to get a contract to write his biography, which I – you know, basically, I started researching when I was still with the Pelicans, believe it or not. Anything in that book that, um, uh, anything you wrote in that book that you didn't write that you wish you would have put in that book? Nah, I don't do that. Okay. You write it, you write it. It's That's there. right. Yep. Okay. Good. Good. Um, anything you want to tell us about Billy Martin? I had a Billy Martin glove when I was a kid. I grew up in New York, as you know, and Billy uh -huh. Martin's World Series experiences were unbelievable. People don't realize this guy hit 250 in his career, and I don't know the statistics exactly what he hit in the World Series, but there were... Oh, he had 12 hits in one of them. Oh, okay. He had, he had 12 so, hits in one um, of them that they won. And he made and that the, catch the saving catch. When, right. Uh, Jackie Robinson pop up. He comes. That's correct. Running. Everybody right. lost to Joe Collins at first, standing, just standing there looking. Right. And Martin comes zooming across the infield. It was. It, you talk about overachievers. If you want to mention Pete Rose, if you want to mention a whole bunch of guys that really are overachievers, they right. hustle more than. You know, they out-hustle everybody or whatever it takes. Billy Martin's the godfather. <laughs> There's no, he was. Nobody was a he, he certainly was. kid. When the, right? Yeah. No, no two ways yeah. about it. I mean, I, 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 I got to do Billy's book 
because when I was doing Dynasty, he was the manager of the Texas Rangers. And so I got down to spring training and I sat with him, and he was wonderful. He could not have been he could not have been more open and more honest and nicer. And when I wrote Dynasty, I basically said that he was as important to the Yankees as was Mickey Mantle or Whitey Ford, and he was. When he was there, he was there in 1950, 1951, 52, 53, and they won all those years. He was in the Army in 54, and they didn't win. And then he came back in August when they were in second place, and then he helped lead them back to the pennant in 55, and then he won, helped them win in 56, and he was traded in 57 because George Weiss was – you know, never liked him, and he had Bobby Richardson The Coco behind Cabana him. In, incident. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely right. Uh, and Bill, all Billy ever wanted to do was be a Yankee. Right, right. Um, and, and George Steinbrenner hired him uh, to be the Yankee manager, and he ended up leading leading the Yankees to pennants in 76 and 77. He got himself fired in 78 because George was driving him crazy. Uh, George right. was a narcissist who uh, always believed he was smarter than his manager and smarter than his general manager, smarter than his PR guy, smarter than the groundskeeper, and uh, he would be firing all these people left and right all the time. Uh, and Billy, who was, you know, as far as I was concerned, the smartest manager of the era, uh, hated being second-guessed, hated being told what to do, uh, and, and just, you know, was really sick of George's uh, interference. And finally, he right. made the famous statement, you know, talking about Reggie Jackson and, and Steinbrenner, uh, one's a born liar and, and the other's convicted. And when con- <laughs> and and convicted, Steinbrenner you know, was. He'd been on suspension. Yeah, he was he, for illegal, Watergate. And not just a baseball thing. He illegal campaigns. I mean, he was federal, right. federal crime. He was a felon. Well, he was lucky. George was very lucky that he wasn't thrown in jail. Uh, he had a, a very famous attorney who, who managed to, uh, you know, he I think he was fined something like $15,000 was all he got as a result of it. Uh, but uh, Bowie Kuhn suspended him for two years. Uh, and and uh, what happened, interestingly enough, I'm, we're getting off the subject, but, but Gabe Paul rebuilt the team while George was away. Because uh, George always thought that he knew more than everybody else, and, and George didn't have a clue, and uh, stupid, stupid trades. Uh, but Gabe Paul was very smart and, and rebuilt the Yankees. Um, and then Billy came in and took that team to a, to to pennants. But George would not, never, ever, ever leave things alone. You know, obviously the Bronx Zoo, which I did with Sparky Lyle, was the very first book to reveal George's craziness. And then the next book, which was number one, which I did with Billy, did the same thing. Uh, absolutely made made Billy crazy as, as made made George crazy as a who now. Uh, it was um, <laughs> made them both made them both crazy. And the well, George and it, Billy exactly. George and Billy made each other crazy. Right, exactly. And George George and, was jealous. George was jealous that Billy was beloved by so many Yankee fans, and Billy was jealous because George was rich. Billy wanted to be oh, really? rich, and George wanted to be loved. And they couldn't stand the fact that either had what the other wanted. And, and that was at the heart of the problem of, of their relationship. Right. Well, not so much. That he, I, it was a class thing. I think that's how Billy saw it. Certainly as, a um, class thing. I, it was absolutely a class thing. That's right. Uh, uh, Billy, Billy, finally, when he started making money, he had a chauffeur and a limo, you know, all those things that George had. You know, right. what the heck do you need a chauffeur and a limo for? I, I actually yeah. interviewed the limo driver for for Wild High and Tight, uh, a really lovely guy who was who was Billy's driver. I mean, it was he was a he was a complicated guy uh, right. who never ever ever should have worked for somebody who hired him five times and fired him five times. You just got to imagine how crazy. A relationship like that is going to make you. Um, yeah, uh, but you ne- it's like a dope addict. <laughs> you know, um, his dope was number one, Billy Martin. <laughs> um, That's right. And, That's right. And that is an yeah, he had a, he had a Yankee addiction. Yes, that's a good point. Right. Yes, he had a Yankee addiction. That's right. 
And, and, and the funny thing was is that Billy really was the only manager who won for George. After they fired Billy, the next guy didn't do a very good job, and he kept bringing him back because it seemed under George that nobody could win except Billy. Well, how, I think Hauser won a little bit. Lemon might have won. Hauser won a little bit, and then and George got rid of him because Hauser didn't realize that if you criticize George in public, he's going to fire you. If you're a narcissist, if you're a narcissist, you know you don't allow people to say bad things about you in public. I mean, Joe Torrey managed to last all the years that he lasted because his father had abused him. And he knew how to handle abusers. And so any time George would say something nasty about Joe Torrey, Joe would keep his mouth shut. Joe would not fight right. back. These other guys would fight back. These other guys would say to, say to themselves, what the hell does George Steinbrenner know about the game of baseball? And he'd go to the Daily News or go to the New York Post or go on radio or TV and say something nasty about George. And once you did that, you were pretty much cooked. You know, right. the, reason, um, the reason George went after Dave Winfield, you remember he went after Dave Winfield? It was the reason he the was foundation. There was something with the foundation. The second time, yeah, the Winfield Foundation. Exactly okay. right. But what happened, uh, Winfield had signed a contract when he came over uh, to the Yankees, and the contract called for a standard of living hike in his contract. If, if, if the... Um, you know, whatever whatever that index is goes up. Right. And George didn't realize it was in the contract. And some New York Times reporter wrote about the clause in that contract. And George was steamed because his, he was embarrassed. He felt that somehow Winfield had taken advantage of him. And so he went to Winfield and said, I want you to take the clause out. And Winfield said, no, I'm not doing that. Well, the contract had a no-trade clause, which was funny, because the first thing George tried to do was trade him. They made some sort of trade, and Winfield said, you can't trade me. I've got a no-clause contract. Not only that, no not only the cost of living, but the no-trade clause. You're right, no-trade clause. Yeah. No, he, he couldn't do that. So then he tried to say nasty things about him in the newspaper, and that didn't seem to do anything. Mr. Well, April. He called him Mr. Exactly. April, I remember. Right, right. So... The next thing he did, there was a guy named Harry, Howie Spira. Howie Spira worked for Dave Winfield at the Winfield Foundation. And Spira knew some fairly negative things about what was going on at the foundation. And he got in touch with Steinbrenner because he figured that Steinbrenner would pay him for that information, which is true. And, and Spira wanted $100,000. And George says, I'll only give you forty. So George gives him the forty. And uh, this guy, Spira, gives him all sorts of negative information about uh, about Winfield. And now at this point, Spira comes back and says, I want the rest of my money. I want the other 60. And George, being the SOB that he is, was, called the FBI and had Spira arrested for extortion. Okay? But what that did, of course, led to him having to admit that he had paid Spira $40,000 for In the, the first information. Place. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, that's right. like calling I mean, the cops. Uh, right, right. How <laughs> stupid, how stupid can you Call be? Calling the cops because somebody stole your weed. <laughs> you know, that, right. Yeah, no, right, that's exactly right. So, so Faye Vincent, you know, a second time, you know, George Steinbrenner suspended for life. It was. Both times it was for life. And the first time it was suspended after two years. And, again, the second time was also suspended after two years. Um, so he well, spent a total of four years under suspension, not just those Yes, two. and those were the two times. Those were the two times. The first time it was Gabe Paul who built the Yankees up to win in 76, 77, 78, and 81. And then the second time it was Gene Michael who was the GM who, you know, that core four, which was actually a core five, uh, right. Derek Jeter, uh, Bernie Williams, Williams and, uh, Pennett, um, the, the great reliever, um, and uh, the catcher. You know, those right. five guys. Um, had George been there, he would have traded them all away. Because he was always trading away his best rookies for over-the-hill veterans. You know, but with George away, the, the, the bunch of them uh, gained some traction. 
on the Yankees and, you know, became the players who took the Yankees to uh, championships in 2000 and on, or one, 1999 and on. I, I can't remember exactly, but I'm close. Um, but the funny thing was is if George had not been suspended those two times, it's possible during the 30 years that he ran the Yankees, he may never have won a pennant. From his own incompetency. Right, exactly. Or his own r- refusal to give up control of the baseball, which he promised when he, he bought the team. He says, you're not going to see much of me. I'm not an expert in baseball. Yeah, he's, he's going like, to be running his ships, is what he said. Uh, right. Which was, you know, could not have been farther from the truth. Could not have right. been farther and, from the truth. Um, time is our, our enemy here. I want you to tell me a little bit about my hero when I was a kid, one of my real heroes that uh, wasn't my grandfather and didn't play for the Giants or the Mets, um, and that's Joe Torre. Uh, uh, when I was a kid in 1961, he came up, Del Crandall was hurt, and he yeah. came up as a rookie from Brooklyn. Um, Frank Torre, his brother, was already on the team. Um, right. I, I think he was talk about overachievers. He was a fat kid, and um, they got him into shape, Warren Spahn and those those guys. And mm-hmm. uh, he's a terrific catcher and a terrific ball player. Um, how did he, just ignoring Steinbrenner when Steinbrenner would say negative things about him, they must have had to negotiate their uh, – have a truce of some kind over over the course of time. How did that work out? No, there was no truce at all. George just blasted him periodically, and he ignored the blast. Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, one of the let's, more disgraceful let's, let's, one, one, one of the more disgraceful aspects of all this is that George, at the end of Tory's reign, was beginning to to show signs of dementia and 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 you know that sort of sort of thing. Right. And and there were two guys in in the front office there who had visions that they were going to take over the Yankees after George finally became non compass mentis. And one of the things they were doing, one of the things they were doing was telling George that Torrey was a lousy manager and that he ought to be fired. And, uh, you know, one of them was the guy who was talking about the, you know, the, the, the why they're not allowing paper tickets anymore because they don't want the people living in the, sitting in the fancy seats to have the hoi polloi sitting next to them. That same guy, that, I can't remember his name, but he, he's, he was one of the two guys trying to get Torrey fired. Because after the game, they would always say to George, oh, did you see what Torrey did in the third inning? He should have done this, he should have done that. And finally they fired him. They finally fired Torrey, which was, which was, was a terrible thing. Now, I never right. felt sorry for Torrey because, you know, the last three, four years he was making something like $8 million a year, which is pretty good money for taking abuse from George. Um, right. But, but he was – I mean, he should be in the Hall of Fame for, for what he did, Torrey should. Torrey did a magnificent job. He really did. And then, uh, quite frankly, the fellow – Girardi. combination of his playing career and his manager oh, career. Yeah. Well, just like Torrey Hodges. was a – yeah, well, just like Hodges. Torrey was the most valuable player one year. Torrey right. had a sensational it's, year, it's I think, with, with Atlanta. Hit 363 as yeah. a third baseman with catcher's legs. You hit 363 with, with catcher's legs, and you no all flat out smacked oh, the ball. Oh, I know it. I know. And the interesting thing about Torrey being hired by the Yankees is that he had been a manager of the Mets, and he had been right. a manager somewhere else. I can't remember the other place he was manager. I but think he had it, was with the, it was with the Cardinals or the Braves. Yeah, I think you're right. I, yeah, one or the other. Uh, right. I think it was the teams yeah. he played. For, he managed all the teams he played for. He managed and, and he had them. bad teams and didn't do well. So when the Yankees right. hired him, there was a real question whether or not this guy was the right guy. They called him like Plain Joe, something right. like that. Joe and, who and or something out, like that. Yeah, yeah, and he turned out to be an absolutely marvelous manager. He turned out to be the perfect guy for all those young kids, uh, Jeter and uh, and and and, and uh, Bernie Williams. Uh, oh yeah, Munson, and you had the pick, number forty. The no, picture. not Munson. Not Munson. The, uh, no, no. Damn nation. No, Munson was was before no, much later than Munson. Uh, right. The catcher was part of that group. 
marvelous, marvelous kid. Uh, Pettit was part of that group. Um, uh, number 42. Come on, help me out here. Fabulous. Williams pitchers. in center field. Williams you in center field. Yeah, tell me the relief pitcher. You had Pettit. You've been there for the last 20 Clemens. years. No, relief pitcher for the last 20 years. Come on. Oh, yeah, and I'm blanking ah, you're, 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 you're listeners all know. You're listening. Your listeners all know. Rivera. Rivera. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Mariano. Right. Mariano was was. Mari- Mariano. George 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 would have traded Mariano out of there so fast his head would have spun. He was a starting pitcher at the time. George was still at the Reigns, and he'd have traded that guy away, and 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 he never would have had the career that he had with the Yankees had George been there. Yeah, Mariano Rivera. Right. right. If you got any hey. editing possibilities, edit that. You know, <laughs> edit the twenty seconds of not knowing who he is out. Yeah, well, you don't have that's human. We're just two guys talking. We we're not expected to get it right every time. Ah, and remember, okay. I, I, I think we no. um, I think we do quite well given everything. Um, for me, this is terrific, and uh, and I enjoy I enjoy your company. You're a mensch. Well, thank you. So thank you so much. We'll do it. Yeah, we'll do it again next week. And uh, excellent. I, I got to tell you something off the air about. Uh, that you'll appreciate. So hold up after I after I um, after I sign off. I just want to tell everybody to hang in there and keep on keeping on. That's it. We'll be back. This is a lot of fun for me. It's Golden Bach University. See you next week, everybody. Hold on. <laughs>